Gaspar David Friedrich, painter of melancholic allegory. Life is a mystery. Our purpose for being beyond what man has hypothesized is a mystery. In the environment in which we exist, we have taken it upon ourselves to study it through centuries in efforts to comprehend, to understand the how and the why of our existence. For many, including myself, there is but one explanation, and it is understood through faith belief that we, this earth, and all that exists on this earth was created by God. In the history of artistic expression, the one movement that explored this and attempted to visually capture the mystery in paint was termed Romanticism a movement that took place approximately between 1800 to 1850 and which grew out of artists' disillusionment with the hedonism of the Rococo movement and the logical and rational principles of the neoclassical movement in favor of an appreciation for the spiritual. Painters in this movement sought to depict nature as divine creation and turned their attention to plain air painting, producing works which were based on close observation of the landscape, as well as the sky and atmosphere, emphasizing nature's power and unpredictability to evoke feelings of awe and wonder to the viewer. Among the greatest to reflect what Edmund Burke termed during the 18th century as a sublime was Caspar David Friedrich, born in Germany in 1774. As a child, Friedrich experienced three traumatic events that I think explain the contemplative melancholic sublimity of his paintings. He lost two sisters to illness, as well as his mother at age seven. And what was probably most traumatic was being present at his brother's drowning as he fell through a thin spot of ice on a lake. All traumatic experiences and the likely catalyst for strong religious beliefs. Man's absolute goal is not man, but the divine, the infinite. It is towards art, not the artist that he should strive. Art is infinite, finite, is all artists' knowledge and ability. These are the thoughts of Caspar David Friedrich, whose works was influenced by the writings of Gothard Kazengarten, a pastor and poet of the Lutheran faith, who stated just as God's book was the Bible, the landscape was God's book of nature, and of poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who encouraged him to make landscape the primary subject of his art. But Friedrich began his artistic career as a draughtsman, and as the following sketches reveal, he was very adept as a sketcher of scenes and portraiture. And he soon took the advice of friends and began to paint landscapes, seeing them as a vehicle through which to achieve spiritual revelation. Throughout his career, Friedrich will return to the theme of the cross, the crucifixion, and of nature, combining these three subjects to create scenes from nature that reflect his sublime quality, acknowledging its immensity as created by God and man's insignificance within it. Beginning in 1805 with the sepia ink drawing titled The Cross in the Mountains, to quote Herman Benkin from the article he wrote on Friedrich, no longer is an objective sacred object represented, but nature itself has become sacred and the crucified savior appears as a work of art in the scenery. Benkin continues, the cross and the lonely infinity of nature raised high above all human life in the silence of the mountains a symbol of faith, and at the same time, a symbol of that cosmic power with which 
to the Christian mind, the death of Christ on the cross as Redeemer of the world is endowed. Friedrich received a commission to create an altarpiece based on the sepia drawing, and in doing so, created what could possibly be considered the first altarpiece that directly includes nature as a visual element of the divine, along with the sacred image of the crucifixion and the cross in his Teshin altar, created in 1808. Around 1818, Friedrich began incorporating the human figure into his work more prominently. He also began to use the technique termed in German as the Rukin figure, where the figure is seen from behind, inviting the viewer to experience what the figure in the painting is experiencing. The technique is seen in the paintings, The Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, Woman at a Window in 1822, Man and Woman Contemplating the Moon, 1824, and a painting I found most compelling, The Stages of Life, painted in 1835. It is in this painting, The Stages of Life, that most prominently feature another theme in his paintings, that of allegoric symbolism. In the painting, The Stages of Life, completed in 1835, it was just six years before the artist left the body. Friedrich presents a poignant, thought-provoking, supreme example of one's journey through life. The painting is a seascape. It can be either dusk or dawn, depending on how you think of it, as both times of the day have the same violet and color effect. At the seashore, you have five individuals, presumably a family, each of various ages, or as in the title, stages of life. Two young children, a young woman, probably their mother, in the prime of her years, an older middle-aged man, and yet older man in his last years. Correspondingly, in the sea, there are five ships of various sizes and distances in the sea. The two closest represent the two young children. The ship in the center of the painting, its focal point and the largest of the ships in terms of perspective, represent the young mother. The other two ships, equally as large, but appearing smaller due to the perspective in the painting, represent the two older men with the oldest man's corresponding ship furthest in the distance, presumably to represent the end of one's life journey. The old Western adage of riding off in the sunset would fit here. The five ships correspond to the people on the shore, each at a different stage in one's life journey. The sky's color, that violet and orange dusk or dawn that I referred to earlier carry meanings as well as the beginning and the end of the day. The colors appear the same. There are some who doubt that the work was meant to be thought of as a painting of symbolic allegory. And it has been said that the painting with its current name was named posthumously. I find that difficult to believe, that it wasn't meant to be an allegoric painting in theme, especially since Friedrich's work, the majority of his work was exactly that, allegoric commentary. Other works in his oeuvre were not without critics. The Teshin altar was criticized by artist and contemporary Basilius von Ramdom, who published a lengthy article rejecting Friedrich's use of landscape in such a context. He asked if whether a pure landscape painting could convey explicit meaning. The 
the German philosopher George Hegel characterized Friedrich's work as a false kind of mysteriousness. With all due respect to the great philosopher, I beg to differ. I see no falsity in the mysteriousness of Friedrich's au revoir. I see truth in his work, a truth that is deep down, emanates a melancholy that exists within all of us as we ponder the mystery of life. Friedrich maintained that his paintings were not to simply repeat views of nature, but to provide the viewer with an opportunity to contemplate God's presence in the world. I think Frederick's work did exactly that.